Thank you, Sister Andrea. Appreciated that. Our rock is Jesus Christ, and we depend on Him and Him alone. I'm trying to do a quick mic check. I think everyone can hear me, right? All right well, good morning. Yes, I should say good afternoon. It just went one minute afternoon. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Check us to the conference, Baltimore White Marsh. I'm really glad to be here. I've been looking forward to being with you and sharing with you. I'm currently a pastor at New Hope Church. I've only been there six months. Uh, before that, I was at Spencerville, and it's been quite the journey. And what I appreciate the most is that God, you know, takes probably the people who might feel the most underserved and puts them in positions and places where he says, I'm going to put you somewhere else. And I'm going to use you. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I'm glad to be here again sharing with you wonderful leaders of Pathfinder, Adventures, Children's Ministries. It's an awesome privilege to be here with you this morning. And before I begin the message, I'd like to pray one more time. If you would please bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wonderful Father that you are. And the fact that we can come to you boldly before you throne. We invite you this morning to come, that you will be with me, that you will infuse me with your Holy Spirit, that your word may shine and it will penetrate the hearts that are here today. Thank you, Father, for this awesome privilege and for using me, a humble servant, in your name. Amen. I'm going to start by asking you a question. And think about it. How many of you would say that you are absolutely completely comfortable with calling yourselves a leader. Hmm. Interesting. I've asked this question, I've asked this question before. And I, it's very intriguing because when I ask it, I, I see the timid hands that say, well, I think I am. And then there's those that, oh yes I am. And then there's like, no, I don't even know why I'm here or why I'm doing this. And I've asked her so many times that I have kind of developed this, this theory, this idea. You know, most people won't put up their hands. And I've come to realize that there is a problem. There is a problem with our definition of leadership. You see, we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We have made leadership into something beyond us. We have made leadership into something that is about changing the whole world. And we have taken the title of a leader and we treat it as something that maybe one day, maybe one day, I could be called a leader. Or maybe something that we just don't deserve, like the word hero. And we give it, and given it ourselves right now, to, to call ourselves perhaps a leader may mean that we have a, le a level of arrogance or cockiness, something that we're not comfortable with. And I worry sometimes as we spend so much time celebrating amazing things that hardly anybody can do, that we convince ourselves that those are only the things worth celebrating. And we start to devalue the things that we can do every single day. And we start to take the moments when we are truly a leader and don't allow ourselves to take acknowledgement or credit for it or allow ourselves to feel good about it, especially especially when we are serving God. But my remind you that it's not about us, it's about God, and He is worth celebrating. And the credit goes to Him, it's not for us. We can celebrate it. Over the years of serving in numerous uh, ministries, and as a pastor, I feel fortunate enough to work in, in different capacities with amazing people who have helped me understand this idea of leadership more. They've helped me redefine and understand what real leadership is about. That working with God and serving God's way 
makes the greatest difference and makes us ultimately happy, much happier. So here's another question I'm going to pose for you. If I were to ask you, who are the truly great men and women of your lifetime? Who would be on your list? Jesus. Amen. So think about it. Some of you might be thinking, certainly Jesus. Some of you may be thinking about celebrities, including maybe some politicians. Maybe some of you might be thinking of some war heroes or sports figures, perhaps. Maybe your parents or special friends that have been very close to you and very dear to you that may come to mind. And you remember those specific people because of the things that they have done, either for the world, for you personally, or perhaps because of their character qualities. You know, besides my parents and some very close friends in my life, I will always remember one particular lady in my life. Her name was Mrs. Perez. I don't even remember her first name. But Mrs. Perez was my first grade teacher. And I loved her. I only knew her for one year of my life, when I was six years old and I attended school in Puerto Rico. You see, my parents have moved from the U.S. I was born in Connecticut. They were living there. That's where they got, where they met, they dated, they went and got married, we were born, and then they decided, well, you know, it's time to put the kids in school, so we're going to take them to Puerto Rico. Now, I didn't speak Spanish then. I spoke mostly English, actually. So I went this English, Spanish, English, all right? <laughs> so that's when you detect an accent. Anyway, so I didn't speak English. And then we moved to be with family I had never met. And not only that, my parents were looking for a place to live. They went to try to get a home, and they couldn't find a place. And the time came for me to start school. So they decide to leave me with my grandparents and register me for the school that was there near them. Now, in the meantime, they go and are living with some of our other relatives. I am staying with my grandparents. I hardly know any Spanish. I'm beginning school in a strange place. The family I'm staying with are strange to me because I really didn't know them. And I had an aunt who was 11 days younger than I was. So my auntie was my contemporary, and she took advantage of me. So anyway, so I was in a situation that was really difficult, and then my parents had moved away, too. They were not with me, and they left me there. And I felt totally abandoned. And I remember going through that and feeling absolutely lost. And as I went through it, I remember going to school, and Mrs. Perez took notice of me. And she spent time with me all the time. She would ask me how I was doing. She would check on me. She would, she would talk to me. If the other kids were teasing me or whatever, that she, 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 was, she would take care of me. And I always will remember that for her, her kindness and just the sweet lady that she was to me. I was there, I finished that year. And then we, I finally joined my family. They had finally found a place, and we moved. And to tell you the truth, that year of my life was probably, I would say, the most horrendous year of my life. Because I did not enjoy staying with my grandparents. We really did not get along very well. And this lady, Mrs. Perez, was the only person who really paid attention to me. And I will be eternally grateful for what she did. And I never had the opportunity to tell her that. I was too young to tell her that. But all over the years, I have always remembered this sweet lady for the attention that she, she gave me. And I don't even know if she's alive or not. I haven't been back there again. I have not had great memories of the area, so I really never went back. And I just have appreciated the, 
the, the impact that she made in my life, early as six years old. And then the difference that she made in my life. And let me also ask you, perhaps of some of the other people that have made an impact in your life and how that came about. Also think about maybe some of the biblical characters that, that you have grown to, to know and understand uh, through sermons that, that have come across your way, through maybe school lessons or personal study books that you have read, people that have been etched in your mind because of the amazing things that they have, do, they have done. And I'm sure that whatever list you come up with, undoubtedly, and those include people that have served God faithfully and courageously. And I'm sure you probably think of the more popular ones, the regular narratives that you hear all the time that we teach our children. You know, you think of Moses and Joshua and Noah and David and Esther, Deborah, Dorcas, Mary, Joseph, and of course, Jesus. But do you remember Ezra? Ezra. Ezra, as a man of God, deserves to be remembered in any discussion of greatness. And sometimes, because they're smaller books, we don't pay too much attention. But Ezra was an amazing leader. Ezra was a priest, a scribe of sorts, a secretary, a teacher, and a great leader. His name actually means help. How would you like to be called help? Help. Helper. <laughs> that was his name. Because his entire life was dedicated to serving God and serving God's people. Ezra is recognized in the Bible for writing most of 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Psalm 119. He also believed to have led the council of 120 men who formed the Old Testament can canon. The narrative of, narrative of the book of Ezra centered on God and his promise that the Jews would return to their land as prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. This message formed the core of Ezra's life, Ezra's life. This is his whole purpose, to get his people back to God. And we're only going to focus on this section of the book of Ezra, this first part of chapter 7. And then we're going to go a little bit into the back end of the book. I would encourage you to read the entire book of Ezra, as well as Nehemiah and Esther. They actually work together. These books are known as the post-captivity historical books. And then if you want to go into the prophetic part of it, you go to Zephaniah, Haggai, and Malachi. The last book of the of Ezra, the last part of Ezra gives us a personal glimpse of who Ezra is. His knowledge of scripture and his God-given wisdom were so obvious to the king that he becomes an appointee for him. Ezra is to lead the second emigration to Jerusalem to teach to the people God's word and to administer national life. And you can see that later on in chapter 7, verses 14 through 26. There's a gap of almost 60 years between chapter 6 and chapter 7. And this is where the story of Esther takes place. It occurred during this time, during the reign of Ahasuerus, who ruled from 8, 486 to 465 BC. And Artaxerxes, his son, became king in 465, and then Ezra returned to Jerusalem in 458. So Ezra spent a long time importing, being, taking, before exporting, giving, and doing. And I'm going to focus on that one little text, verse number 10. If you turn with me to Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. I'd like you to read this with me again. Chapter 7, verse 10. 
For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So as we read this text, this is what it's telling us, that there's an order of priorities here for Ezra. And these are really key principles for us to draw from in leadership. In fact, there are three prominent priorities. And I would describe it as perhaps Ezra's motto, learn it, leave it, loan it. Learn it, live it, loan it. So to learn it, Ezra studied and discovered the truth himself. He spent the time studying, searching. At a very young age, he diligently committed to searching the scriptures, to study them and learn them. He became a scholar, and a scholar at that time was known as the people that were most educated. And he knew God's word. He believed it, and he obeyed it. And he determined to follow God's law and to teach it. And as a spiritual leader, Ezra had prepared himself. He studied. He equipped himself and connected with many of the ordinary Jews. And his influence encouraged many to follow him to Jerusalem during this time of restoration. Not only that, he lives it as well. Ezra practiced and applied what he had learned. He internalized it. He learned about politics. He learned about how government ran. He won the respect of many of the political leaders of the land of his exile, and even King Artaxerxes. And although Ezra's passion and vision centered on Jerusalem, that's where it focused, he clearly kept himself busy doing God's word while in exile. And he established connections and influence over time, a necessary step, a step for him to fulfill the dreams of Jerusalem, for them to come together again. And as a result of many years of consistently doing the right thing, the king finally trusted Ezra with great power and resources. And we have other examples like that in the Bible. He acknowledged his character and the qualities that he had in the writing and the letters that the king wrote. And on the basis of King Artaxerxes' decree, Ezra was able to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem, which indicates that he also gained the trust of the king. He provided everything that Ezra needed to get the work done. Ezra did not use his power, intellect, and influence for personal gain. He used it to restore Jerusalem, to bring God's people back to him. And when Ezra arrived in Jerusalem and found that the remnants of Jews had disobeyed God and polluted the bloodlines of his people, he did not shrink his responsibility from making the tough calls that he had to make. He didn't, he didn't abandon that. He continued to do what was necessary. So not only he learned it, he lived it, and then he loaned it, which means that Ezra passed on to others what he had already gained, what he had fully embraced. So as a priest, he felt committed to establishing spiritual priorities among the people, especially as it related to the new temple that had just been built. Throughout his life, Ezra, Ezra exercised the very best leadership qualities with both passion and enthusiasm, which God used to ultimately fulfill his work. And his response helped lead the people back to God. His example of humble confession it tells us there in this chapter, led the people back to revival, a national revival. And Ezra here shows us what is called the law of the picture. People do what people see, people follow what people do. So he felt genuine remorse 
over national sin, and the people felt remorse. He issued a proclamation for the Jews to gather together in Jerusalem, and the people were moved, and they gathered to hear him, to hear him, hear him speak God's word. He spoke clearly and directly concerning the issue. People listened and responded, and he challenged the people to repent and change. And people confessed and asked for forgiveness. And he accepted a plan for the leaders to meet with their transgressors. And people pledged to follow the plan. He strategized and worked with the leaders who failed, then moved to the people to work with them. And that brought about public repentance of reformation. And the people were restored. So yes, Ezra, was a man of God and a true hero. He was a model for Israel, and he is a fitting model for us today as we talk about leadership. A humble, obedient helper. He had the heart of a leader fully committed to his God. You see, by observing Ezra's life, we should recognize that we don't need to feel inadequate, or feel lesser than about the work that God has asked us to do. Even volunteer work, each one of us has a particular and unique uh, gift, set of skills and abilities, a unique responsibility that God has reserved just for each one of us. And we are expected to do it and be accountable to God and God alone. Ezra's example helps us understand what real leadership looks like. Is leadership redefined? What God expects from us is not the type of leadership that the world expects from us. God expects so much more. But humbleness and commitment are at the core of what is needed to do the work. The good principles that the world may teach us. Many out there, you can attend all sorts of leadership conferences and all of that out there in the world, and they can teach you a lot. But with God's word, we can learn so much more to fill our lives with great wisdom and maturity. The priorities that Ezra demonstrates are the same for us today as well. Learning, living, loaning, better yet, import before export. What we take in, we give out. The starting place for leading is a personal commitment with God to serve Him, even before knowing what that service is going to be, what it will be like. Importing by learning. We humble ourselves and commit to God to spend the time to research, to learn, to equip, to believe and obey. Understanding that we cannot give away what we don't have. You can't, you can't go on empty expecting to fill others. It cannot happen. If you're empty, how can you fill others? Which means that God wants to construct our being first before we go to our doing. We import truth before we export truth. So we import by living, even when we don't think we're making a difference, or helping a situation, bringing resolution, or being effective, we remain faithful, faithful to God. We stand for God and do not compromise the truth. That's what he's asking us to do. By going to God in prayer, He can guide us through any situation, any challenge, and help us lead successfully. So exporting by loaning it, by giving it out, by taking it and giving it out to others, by guiding, by teaching, by being examples, by becoming mentors, and building a legacy of godly leadership. Amen. Ultimately, making a difference in someone's life for the kingdom of God. And then we invest some more.
we repeat. We invest in someone else so they too can go and be great leaders and make a difference. The greatest legacy we can leave in this world is the legacy of our young people, investing in our young people. And this is why you're here today. This is what you're doing. This can make the greatest difference. And this is why you have been called. You have been called for a specific purpose. You're not here by coincidence. You are here to import, to gain, to take everything that you can, learning. And then when you're ready, when God says you're ready, to export by sharing it and investing it in others. It reminds me of a story of Drew Dudley, a university professor. He shares that it was registration day and he had been asked to help during registration time. Sort of talk to the students as they were coming and getting acquainted with the families. And as he was walking, he was coming in and um, he had a sign trying to promote and encourage a support for a charity. And he also had with him a bucket full of lollipops. And as he was going down the lane, he was talking to different people down the, the long line of students waiting to be registered. He comes across a young lady, and there's a young man standing next to him. And as he's uh, walking, he decides to go talk to the young man. And he says, young man, here's a lollipop for you. You have a beautiful young lady standing right next to you. Give it to her. And the young man kind of like <laughs> gives it to her and looks away. And then the teacher, the professor, turns to the parents and says, Isn't that something? The first day she comes to school, she talks to strangers and tastes candy from them. Your children, what can we do with them? And of course, everyone likes, just breaks into laughter. Well, push forward four years later, and this young lady comes to this professor and tells him that he, she wants to talk to him. She had found out that he was leaving, leaving the school to move to another place. And she came to him and said, Professor, I need to share a story with you because you made a difference in my life. And he said, oh, well, you see, I don't know if you remember, but the first day I came to this school, I was in a line, a long line with my parents. And before coming to the school, I had told my parents, I don't want to come here. I don't want to be here. I want to go home. And my parents said, give it a day. Let's just go. Let's just go and see what it's like. At least experience it. The first day, give it a try. And if you still feel that way, we'll go home. So she decided to do that. And as she was at the line, waiting, she kept looking at everyone, looking at everything, and she, that, right there at that moment she had made up her mind, she was going to go home. That that was not the place for her. And as she was turning to tell her parents, let's go, I'm ready to go, this is when that professor comes and gives that lollipop to that young man. And she says, you don't understand. When you did that, you changed my life. And I'll tell you why. Because at that moment, I was ready to give up on everything. Everything. And that moment, when you came to that young man, and he gave me that lollipop, and everybody broke into laughter, I felt like I was at home. You made me feel like I was part of something. And that changed my mind for me to stay here at this school. And this man, as he's hearing this, this professor, as he's hearing this young lady tell this story to him, you know, she says to him, you made a difference in my life, and I'm going to miss you. She's a total stranger. He did not even recollect the incident at all. And he says, isn't it something? This was an eye-opening, transformative moment for him. To think that maybe the biggest impact he ever had 
in everyone's life, a moment that had made a woman walk to him, a complete stranger, four years later and say to him, you've been an incredible, important person in my life, was the moment he didn't even remember. How many of you have a lollipop moment that you can recall? A moment where someone says something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better. How many of you told that person they did it? Oftentimes we don't have the opportunity. And why not? We celebrate great moments in our lives. We celebrate birthdays. But really, all we're celebrating is that we didn't die 365 days of the year. Right? And why, don't, why not? Why not celebrate those moments? And let the people know that they have made our lives better. And walk, and there's so many out there that walk around without even knowing it. This is what I want you to remember today. Every single one of you here today is, has been a catalyst for a lollipop moment. You have made someone's life better by something that you said or something that you did. And if you think you haven't, think probably about the many times that you have felt that you have not made any impact, you haven't influenced anyone. You're feeling down because you feel like, why bother? Why am I doing this? It doesn't matter. I'm sure many of you have asked that before because I have been there. You just haven't been told. You just haven't been told the great impact that you have been. And I, I know it is scary to think of ourselves as being that powerful. It can be frightening to think that we can matter that much to other people. But we can be exactly that when we have God's power and we utilize it for His purpose. Marion Williamson said, she's an author, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that frightens us. My challenge to you is that we need to get over our fear of how extraordinarily powerful we can be in each other's lives. God is on our side. We need to get over it so we can move beyond it. So that those that are around us can watch and begin to value the impact we can have in each other's lives. More than any money, power, titles, and influence this world can offer. And I offer to you that we need to redefine leadership as lollipop moments. Lollipop moments. You know, those moments <laughs> that we can create, those moments that we can acknowledge it, those moments that we can pay forward, and those moments that we can say thank you for. We need to create those moments. And this is why we're here today, to learn, to live, and then to loan what you have gained. Importing, then exporting. By the way, this is my contribution to potluck today. <laughs> Just a reminder. By changing one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them. By changing one person's understanding of how powerful an agent they can be for change in this world, you can redefine leadership in God's terms. We can be leaders like Ezra. Bold and unapologetic. God has called us and everything we do for Him has Volume. 
We can celebrate every single moment and feel good about it because God rewards our faithfulness and obedience. It's just like having a lot of power. <laughs> our lives are connected through exchanges of imports and exports, and they do make a difference. Let's be ready to export, to share, to offer God's love, goodness, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and salvation. God bless you. Amen.